So this will be a talk on syringomyelia, and I included this in a wider uh, talk of multiple different spinal cord lesions. We're only going to talk about syringomyelia here. I think this is the first one to start with because this is the easiest to understand. Uh, but we'll also talk about subacute combined degeneration, brown sequard, ASA occlusion, cauda equina syndrome, and spinal compression. So if you haven't watched my review on uh, neuroanatomy, I strongly suggest you do that just because it's, uh, uh, it's really good to have an idea of how these traps work to really have a good understanding of when we have a lesion somewhere in the nervous system, why does it produce the symptoms it does. And of course, when you're in practice, if you're not using this uh, on a relatively regular basis, it's really easy to forget about it because the brain doesn't use information, it kind of throws it out. So anyhow, corticospinal tract is exactly what it says, cortical to spine. And so we start with our motor cortex, and that sends upper motor neurons through the internal capsule, which are lateral to the thalami, and those project downward through the, uh, through the uh, columns, uh, down through the medulla, and at the medulla, lower part of the medulla, they uh, decussate. And when they decussate, then uh, they move uh, more anteriorly and laterally. So the, uh, or, I'm sorry, more, more posteriorly and laterally. So uh, once that happens, they continue. They're still the same nerve. They're still upper motor neurons. And they continue all the way to wherever they synapse. And where they synapse is uh, usually uh, determines where they're going. Uh, nerves that innervate the arm, of course, are going to synapse higher than nerves that innervate the leg. So uh, at that point, once they synapse, then uh, it's considered the lower motor neuron. It's a different nerve. So these circles represent a synapse. And uh, then that ultimately goes to muscle. The DCML tract is a sensory tract. So here we're starting at the periphery, periphery and moving towards the brain. And uh, so we start out, uh, DCML, remember, is how we uh, feel proprioception, how we feel uh, fine touch. Uh, so this is going to start at the skin or wherever we're sensing the, uh, the sensation. And it's going to send its neurons in through the, uh, through the posterior horn. And at the posterior horn, it's going to travel upwards through the DCML tract. Uh, so once we get into the spinal cord, we're, uh, we're synapsing. So this is a new neuron. And, uh, so this is a secondary neuron traveling up through the DCML tract. And then there's a decussation at the superior medulla. So the reason I wanted to uh, differentiate this is that the DCML tract decussates higher than the corticospinal tract. Okay. And from there, it goes to the thalamus. So this is the contralateral thalamus, because remember, we've decussated. And at the contralateral thalamus, we again have synapse, and then that goes to the somatosensory cortex. OK, finally, the spinothalamic tract. The spinothalamic tract is how we feel pain and temperature and crude touch. And it works in a pretty similar way to the DCML tract, with the exception of one major difference. So the spinothalamic tract also starts uh, at the periphery, enters through the posterior horn, but the spinothalamic tract decussates right away. So it decussates either at the level it enters or maybe a level or two uh, up. And where it travels to its decussation is called the tract of Lasauer. So we get this, we get this uh, where it enters the, at the uh, posterior horn, uh, and as it's moving to decussate, it synapses, and then that second neuron finishes the decussation. And then it travels uh, on the spinothalamic tract all the way up to the thalamus. And that's, again, the contralateral thalamus to where you entered. So it's always going to be the contralateral thalamus and the contralateral cortex because you synapse before you get to the thalamus. Or, I'm sorry, you decussate before you get to the thalamus. So... Just like the DCML tract, we enter on the opposite side to where we finish at the cortex. The only difference is uh, when we decussate. And with the spinothalamic tract, we decussate right away. And that's going to play a big role when we talk about when we have a lesion at the spinal cord, 
uh, how does that affect the spinal thalamic tract differently than it affects the DCML tract, and for that matter, the corticospinal tract. So these are just sort of cross sections. They're not perfect, they're not to scale, but I just wanted to show the relation of DCML and spinothalamic and corticospinal tract in relation to one another. So remember your corticospinal tract, it starts at your motor cortex, and as it comes down, it decussates. And when it, where, where it decussates, now we're going this way, we're going uh, posteriorly here. Uh, it, uh, these are columns here. Uh, uh, from there, it goes to, uh, to these uh, more lateral and posterior parts of the spinal cord. So here's our decussation here, and then we're traveling uh, sort of this posterolateral lateral uh, section. And then from there, it sends its mo uh, projection, and then the lower motor neuron exits to the anterior horn. Now, on the other hand, where we have our DCML, remember the DCML is a sensory tract, so it starts at the bottom. Uh, it starts at the uh, periphery, and it travels in this little niche right here, this posterior column, dorsal column, just like its name. It travels up, and then it decussates at the superior part of the medulla, and then travels in this medial lemniscus. And then the corticospinal tract, as mentioned, is uh, more lateral. Uh, it decussates right away and projects straight up to the thalamus from there. Okay. There's a DCML, corticospinal tract, and spinal thalamic tract. So what is syringomyelia? So syringomyelia is a cyst in the central canal of the spinal cord. Through the spinal cord, we have uh, a, a, uh, this canal that runs through. And if we have any kind of obstruction, that canal can become full of cerebrospinal fluid, and that can ultimately compress the nerve surrounding it. Now, this is a slow process and usually it results from some very specific things, but it does progress uh, uh, over time. So if it's not treated, it doesn't remit on its own. And over time, the, uh, the cyst is going to elongate. It's not going to push outward. Uh, the, the pressure is, uh, is lesser as it, for it to go downward. So this is a, this is a cyst that's gonna be really long and narrow. Uh, and the longer it gets, the more nerves it's going to compress on more levels. So as it elongates, you're going to have worsening symptoms, progressive symptoms. And this causes loss of pain and temperature sensation over the affected dermatomes. So why would it, first off, what is pain and temperature? What tract is that? That is the spinothalamic tract. Why is it affecting the spinothalamic tract? Well, what does the spino spinothalamic tract do that makes it unique? It decussates right away. And so in order to decussate right away, it's got to cross the middle of the spinal cord. So if it's crossing the middle of the spinal cord and the central canal is in the middle of the spinal cord, then anything that affects the uh, central canal and makes it bigger is going to really affect uh, the spinothalamic tract. And indeed, the spinothalamic tract is the main tract that gets affected. Other tracts can be affected if it gets really, really large, but classically on the USMLE, syringomyelia will affect the spinothalamic tract. So it gives you a loss of pain and temperature sensation over the affected dermatomes. And of course, that's going to depend on how big the cyst is. Usually, the cyst exists in the cervical spine, and that gives off, or in this case, receives nerves coming from your upper back and your arms. So it's going to be in this cape-like distribution where you have effect from your upper back and down your arms. And that's going to be where you have your loss of pain and temperature sensation. A lot of these cases are linked to a congenital condition called Arnold Chiari malformation. And that is a congenital disorder that affects how the cerebellum relates to the foramen magnum of the skull. And so what you can get is if, these, if the cerebellum uh, herniates into where the spinal cord should be, it can uh, cause a, uh, an obstruction, and that's going to lead to this, uh, this cyst formation. But there are multiple ways you can get syringomyelia. Okay, so here's our cervical spine, DCML. Here's our uh, corticospinal tract, and here's our spinothalamic tract. This is the anterior part of the corticospinal tract, the part that doesn't decussate. This is the lateral part of the corticospinal tract that does decussate in the middle. And here's our syringomyelia. So syringomyelia is uh, is um, this isn't I mean this isn't 
perfect. This is just a sort of an illustration. But you can see here that here is our normal central canal, and if we have this syrinx, it's going to be much larger. And when it's larger, it is going to compress these uh, these nerves here that are decussating, and that is the spinal thalamic tract. Now, because this affects the cervical spine and maybe upper thoracic spine, it's going to affect the arms, upper back, upper chest. It's not going to affect the legs or the feet because we don't get syringomyelia down there. So it's going to be this cape-like distribution. So you should know if you have a cape-like distribution of loss of pain and temperature sensation, then you have syringomyelia because you have this syrinx, this cyst, that's affecting your spinal thalamic tract. And so it's com compressing, decussating fibers. So it is bilateral because it's in the middle. So it's going to affect uh, the tracts from coming from both directions. So the causes, this can be post-trauma. So if you have a spinal, uh, if you have some kind of spinal injury, that may cause inflammation and, uh, and compensate the, the uh, central canal. It can be the neoplasm because neoplasm can cause an obstruction. It can be a complication of meningitis, a long-term complication of meningitis. But like I said, most commonly, it is a complication of patients who are born with this Arnold Chiari malformation. And to diagnose syringomyelia, the initial and best diagnostic test is an MRI. And the reason is because there's really no other way to see into the spinal cord than an MRI. MRI is the best way to do that. So what are we looking for in syringomyelia? What do these patients have? Well, they have, most of them have a history of Ar Arno Chiari malformation. Of course, some of them may not know that, so you may not have that in the history. I wouldn't expect the USMLE to give you that in the history because it's kind of a giveaway. Some of them may have recent head or neck trauma or recent meningitis, but again, most of these patients do uh, have Arno Chiari malformation. Even if they haven't had it diagnosed, once they get the MRI, and you see there is a, a slight herniation of the cerebellum into the, uh, into the spinal area uh, through the foramen magnum. Uh, a lot of times the patient will often report a history of upper extremity sensory disturbances. So this is not an acute disease. This is something that builds up over time. So it may be something that it starts in their fingertips and it really doesn't bother them, but over time it progresses. So most of these patients will say, yeah, I've been kind of having these, these symptoms of, of, of numbness for like the last six months or the last seven months. So this is definitely not an acute disease. It's not something you wake up with the next day. Um, so dysfunction, the symptoms of course are as plain as what it is, it's just dysfunction of the spinal thalamic tract, and it's going to depend on the extent and location of the syrinx. So you don't necessarily have to have that entire cape-like distribution. It might just be parts of it if it's a small syrinx. But uh, generally, that cape-like distribution is how it, it classically presents. When you do the full-on neurologic exam and you do like the pinprick or the ice versus the warm metal or whatever you use, uh, you're going to note that that's lost. However, when you take a tuning fork and place that on the patient's shoulder or on their hand with their eyes closed, they will be able to uh, note their vibratory sensation. That's intact because that's through the DCML. And the DCML is intact with most syringomyelias. Physical, so physical exam is just a loss of pain and temperature sensation. A lot of times, the upper extremity and deep, uh, the upper extremity deep tendon reflexes are diminished uh, because those are carried on your uh, on your pain fibers. So because those are uh, those are uh, stretch receptors. So uh, so I would expect uh, that the DTRs would be at least diminished, if not absent. And then uh, the best initial diagnostic test, as mentioned, is a cervical MRI. Okay, so differential diagnosis for syringomyelia. So um, on the USMLE, it should be pretty clear that the patient has syringomyelia, but I just want to give you sort of a rundown of a few things that may, other things that may cause distal numbness or paresthesias like syringomyelia does. So subacute combined degeneration is uh, a B12 deficiency. And what are we going to see that in? Usually those are patients with a history of alcoholism, a, pa a patient with malnutrition, a uh, patient that uh, doesn't eat meat, 
a patient that uh, has a, uh, a um, intrinsic factor deficiency, so pernicious anemia. And the thing that separates subacute combined degeneration uh, is that apart from the separate history, typically it affects also the lower extremities in addition to the upper extremities. Uh, and also you're going to have deficits in proprioception uh, and some upper motor neuron signs. So with subacute combined degeneration, uh, you're going to have uh, hyperreflexia, you're going to have Babinski sign because you're affecting upper motor neurons. And subacute combined degeneration also affects the DCML. So you're going to have deficits in proprioception. So that's uh, the main difference from syringomyelia. Diabetic neuropathy also can give you that numbness and paresthesias, those uh, sort of pins and needles feelings. Those patients should have a history of uncontrolled diabetes that should be relayed to you in the question. Uh, but uh, generally for these patients, they still do feel pain and, uh, and temperature. That should remain intact. Uh, and this shouldn't affect them in a cape-like distribution. Usually patients with di diabetic neuropathy, it first affects their feet. And if you did go ahead and get an MRI on these patients, the MRI would be normal. At least they wouldn't have a syrinx. And when I show you the MRI for syringomyelia, you'll see, wow, yeah, that's really obvious. Okay, multiple sclerosis, that can also give numbness and paresthesias, but with multiple sclerosis, it's an inflammatory disorder. The symptoms wax and wane. You can also get optic neuropathy, which definitely doesn't happen in syringomyelia. Uh, more particular with MS, you get optic neuritis, which is pain and moving the eyes. Uh, you can you also have weakness as a pretty salient feature with multiple sclerosis. Syringomyelia does not affect the corticospinal tract, so it does not cause weakness. Sensory losses usually uh, feature early on in multiple sclerosis, uh, but the symptoms wax and wane. So. If you have symptoms that are coming and going, that's not syringomyelia. Syringomyelia starts on uh, really light and gets worse and worse and worse as times go on. You will also have upper motor neuron signs in multiple sclerosis quite often. And if you get a CT or MRI, you would see CNS plaques in the brain. Remember Dawson's fingers. And then neoplasm can present similarly, but it will be clearly different on MRI. Okay, so this is your spinal cord here, and this is your syrinx. So this is a T1 MRI, and uh, here's your syrinx. So there shouldn't be this black here. This should be the same as on the bottom here. And this is actually a Chiari malformation too. Uh, this is a herniated uh, cerebellum. It's herniated below the foramen magnum. But this is your syrinx. So it's going to affect uh, these levels. They can actually be bigger. I think I've got pictures of bigger ones. Okay, here's a, here's another one. This affects this is affecting a little bit lower here. So here you got a T1 MRI and a T2 MRI. T2 MRI is a little easier to see. That can be missed pretty easily if you're not a radiologist. So T2 MRI is good. Okay, here's this one's a little bit longer. And again, you see uh, Syringomyelia. This is a syrinx. It, it's kind of, I don't know. It's kind of. It looks like it's kind of. It kind of goes up a little further, but it gets kind of fat right here. But these, these two patients, they don't appear to have Chiari malformation. So it can happen in patients who don't have that. Okay. Here's here's the big one. I knew I had a big one here. Okay. So this is a T2 MRI, and this is going way down. This looks like a Chiari malformation. Okay, so what do we do to treat patients with syringomyelia? The only treatment for syringomyelia is surgical decompression. Does that mean all patients are appropriate for surgical decompression? No, but all patients who are diagnosed with syringomyelia should be referred to a neurosurgeon so that they can evaluate whether or not the patient can get decompression of the syrinx. This isn't really a deadly disease. It's just really a pain in the butt. So. It's not something that warrants immediate therapy uh, as far as surgery, but any patient that's diagnosed should be at least evaluated for surgical decompression. And that's it.